92, Psalm and chapter number 92. I want to bring a message on one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 92. The title of the psalm says, A Psalm or Song for the Sabbath Day. Uh, it's the only psalm that is titled that way. You notice that at the top where it says Psalm 92 underneath it. It says, A Psalm or Song for the Sabbath Day. Now, the Sabbath day was Saturday for the Jews. And good Jewish men and women went to the synagogue in the town, wherever they happened to be living, or if they were near the temple in Jerusalem, they would go to the temple every single Saturday. They would uh, never, ever uh, miss. It is said about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. As his custom was, every single Saturday for 28 years, when Jesus lived in Nazareth, he went to the synagogue in Nazareth. Real small place. I've been there. Archaeologists have dug it up. It's about the size of this little addition right here. Jesus went there, like what we would call going to church, he went there for 28 years, from about the time he was two years of age until he was 30, and he then moved up into Capernaum. When you read the Gospels, you'll read of so many different events that took place in the synagogue in Capernaum, where Jesus attended church there for about three years. Three times a year, it was required of Jewish men to present themselves to the Lord in Jerusalem at the temple. And so whenever he went down to Jerusalem uh, for the Passover, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, whatever it was, uh, he would present himself, he would go to the, te the temple. And I believe this verse shows us as his custom was, he went up into the synagogue uh, on Saturday, on the Sabbath day. And uh, that's a good custom to have. Uh, church attendance is a good custom to have. The Apostle Paul, it says of him in Acts chapter 18 and verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and uh, the Greeks. And it says about the Apostle Paul in another text, as his manner was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. It says about Jesus as his custom was. It says about Paul as his manner was. And both of these who are our two greatest examples, Jesus, the divine son of God, God the son in the flesh, our ultimate example, our highest example, Jesus Christ, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue. And the apostle Paul, who is our human pattern, God chose him to be a pattern to all who hereafter should believe. And several times, I think three times, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. He said in Philippians 4, verse 9, those things which thou hast seen and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul is an example, and as his custom was. Now, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here today because you're in church. But uh, it was the custom of Jewish men and Jewish women to go to the synagogue or to the temple every single Saturday. When they did, they would sing this psalm every single Saturday. It was probably the most well-known of all the songs. It's called a song for the Sabbath day. I brought this message earlier this morning over at our other church in Angola, and we have a Jewish man there uh, who uh, uh, has attended for years and years and years, and he grew up in the Hebrew schools in New York City. And uh, he said uh, to me, he said, I, I, I have that psalm memorized. I could sing it to you in Hebrew this morning. And he started singing it to me uh, in Hebrew. Without a doubt, this is one of the songs from the Jewish songbook, which is the 150 psalms. That's their songbook, just like we have these blue ones and red ones. They, this is their songbook. This was one of the songs that they sang so often, I'm sure they all had it memorized, kind of like with us 
when we're singing at Calvary or How Great Thou Art or Amazing Grace or how, you know, songs like that. We don't even have to look at the words anymore. We have them memorized. This psalm, this psalm was one that uh, Jewish men and women who were faithful to attendance would sing every Sabbath and would have it memorized uh, as our brother in Angola. Now, we do not know the author of this psalm. Many of the psalms we know were written by David. Others were written by Moses. Some were written by um, Ethan and uh, some by the sons of Korah, some by, some by the sons of Asaph. Uh, a lot of them are, are designated who wrote the psalm. This one is not. We do not know who wrote this, but we thank God for it. It's one of my favorite. We're just going to go down through it here uh, this morning. This is not going to be like a typical sermon uh, that I usually give where there's just one or two or three points, but uh, this is kind of like scattered. It's kind of like buckshot. I'm just kind of hoping something today will hit you and uh, be applicable to you personally. Um, and uh, I, I love it, though. So let's get started here in verse number one. It says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. As uh, uh, Brother Callan was saying in the announcements today, boy, if you can sing, if you're a man and you can sing, sing. Why? It's a good thing. That's why. Some people can't sing. They wish they could sing. And those of you that can't sing, remember the Bible says over and over again, I think 14 times, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We ought to sing. We ought to be a singing people. That ought to be unique to the Christian who's been born again, that they sing. You ought to sing in the shower. You ought to sing in the car. You ought to sing at home. You ought to sing at work. You ought to sing in church. It's just something about us that we ought to be a singing people. You know, singing is unique to Christianity. Uh, it's amazing. We, uh, we, we, you know, we certainly tolerate, uh, because we're Christians, we we, we, we tolerate the existence of other people, their philosophies, whether they're atheists, agnostics, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, or whatever. That, that, that's what we believe. Uh, we, we believe in freedom, and uh, we believe in soul liberty, and we believe anybody who wants to can be born again, can be saved, can trust Christ as their Savior. But we are not intolerant. Uh, we don't go around killing people who are Islam or Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist. We don't do that. The scripture says, you know, no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And uh, so we, we believe in freedom, and we want, but we want freedom for all Americans, just not for just small groups. But you know, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name. I know one man who's a Christian, and, and, and he's not aware of it, but a man, another man who works with him uh, uh, told me this one time. He goes to our church, and uh, not the other man, but... The one man he was talking about, he says, you know, he's always singing at work. He's always singing hymns, and he's not even aware that he's doing it sometimes, and it's a testimony. It's a testimony to those around him who are unsaved, that he's got a song in his heart. There's something about it. You know, there's very little music in the religion of Islam. There's very little music. There's some chanting in Buddhism and Hinduism and so on and so forth. Our faith is rich with music. Over a million songs have been written about Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's unique. Every one of us can have a personal relationship with him that can foster new songs. Sing unto the Lord a, a new song. A new song. And, and, and I promise you the next generation of born-again believers who trust Christ as their Savior, God will be giving them new songs we've never heard before. That's just something. I believe that's one of the greatest proofs about Christianity, that our God is real, is that he puts in a, a song in our hearts, even praise. And even uh, in the night, he gives songs in the night. And, and so many of our songs were birthed in the worst times of people's lives. Some of those beautiful songs we sing. Only God can do that. Music is a powerful medium. And we ought to use it to worship God and praise and bless his holy name. And, and, and we've, got a, we've got a song book, uh, song books and and uh, that just have barely scratched the surface of the songs that have been written about Jesus Christ. You know why? It's because these songwriters, I'll tell you why, they have a personal relationship with Christ. Christ is real. Maybe those other religions don't have songs because he's not real. You ever think of that? 
Now, when it says it's a good thing in verse 1, we gotta, that, that should give us a little bit of a warning. It's a good thing to give thanks, and it's a good thing to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. Why? It's a good thing. Because in James 4 and verse 17, it says, For him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Right? So if it's good to thank the Lord, and if it's good to sing praises unto the Lord and we're not doing it, amen? It's kind of like prayer. If you know it's good to pray and you don't pray, if it's good to sing and good to th give thanks, then brethren, all of us need to start giving thanks to God. And we need to be singing. We need to be a singing people. A singing people. Why? He's the most high. El Elyon is the word in Hebrew for the most high in verse number one. And that is the name that Satan, Lucifer, tried to capture for himself in his rebellion. And in his words in Isaiah 14, Lucifer said, I will be like the Most High. Notice God is the Most High here in verse 1. You see it? O Most High. That's the Hebrew word El Elyon. That's what Lucifer tried to be, the Most High. But God said, Oh, no, you won't. Thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And God prepared hell, according to Matthew 25 and verse 41. For the devil and his angels, not for man. God doesn't want man to go there. Men and women just follow Lucifer in their rebellion against God. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He died upon the cross and died a violent uh, death for us and shed his blood so we could all be saved and go to heaven. God wants us to be in heaven with him. But Lucifer tried to steal this name in verse 1, O Most High, El Elyon. You know, God has many wonderful names, and this is really the most impersonal, the most high. All the rest are personal. Jehovah, the eternal, ever-loving one. el Roi, thou, Lord, seest me. Remember Hagar? She was the one that came up with that name about God. I'm just a little Egyptian handmaid sent out to pasture to die, but God saw me and gave me a well, preserved me and my son, el Roi. And El Shaddai, the all-sufficient, satisfying one. And Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. And Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. But you notice Lucifer didn't use any of these names. Why? He doesn't care about the human race. God does. God cares about you. Lucifer didn't say, I want to be like Jehovah Shalom and give people peace. Lucifer didn't say, I want to be like Jehovah Rapha and give people healing. He didn't say, I want to be like Jehovah Sidkenu and, and give people righteousness. And I want to be like Jehovah Nissi and give people a banner to fight under. He didn't say, I want to be like El Shaddai and, and satisfy people. No, he said, I want to be the Most High. I want to be El Elyon. I want to dominate people. But that name is reserved for God, and it'll come up again later in the psalm. But we ought to give thanks, and we ought to sing praises unto God most high. Verse number 2, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every single night. We ought to have in verse 2, every one of us, a wake-up meditation and a bedtime meditation. Our wake-up meditation ought to be on the loving kindness of God in the morning, and our bedtime meditation ought to be on his faithfulness every night. Amen. God meets us with loving kindness every morning. Aren't you glad about that? I mean, even if you blew it yesterday, and yesterday was the worst day of your life, and you were carnal, and you were backslidden, and you're absolutely ashamed of the way you lived yesterday, you know what the Lord meets us with in the morning? Loving kindness. It's like he's our biggest cheerleader. He puts his arm around us and says, let's try again. Let's try again. And I believe the same thing was said by Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. In verses 22 and 23, when he said, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Every morning. Every morning. No leftovers. Every single morning, the Lord meets us with new compassions and says, I don't care about yesterday, how bad you blew it. No leftovers. His mercies are new every morning. Great 
is thy faithfulness. Mercy in the morning, faithfulness in the evening. Brethren, I want to encourage you to enjoy and think upon the loving kindness of God every morning. And if you will, at night when you pillow your head, you'll say he's been faithful today. He's been faithful today, praise God, and thy faithfulness every night. Musical instruments, verse 3. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery and upon the harp with a solemn sound. Our God has invented music. He invented the laws of music before they were ever written down and you study them at Florida State or Fredonia State, wherever you go. You know, Florida, that'd be nice. <laughs> right about now, but Fredonia State. You know, God made all those musical laws before we ever discovered them. And there's a lot of spiritual truths in musical laws too, by the way. It's amazing stuff. In harmony. Who would have only thought but God to give some women voices that are soprano, some women voices that are alto, some men who have tenor voices, and some men who have bass voices, and then you put them all together and you get harmony. And it's just fascinating. But the same thing with musical instruments. Brethren, musical instruments are another opportunity for you and I to praise the, the name of the Most High God. And we ought to use musical instruments. And I'm encouraging those of you that are in this room today that if you used to play a musical instrument, that you get it out, blow the dust off of it, and start playing it again for the Lord. And teach your children about musical instruments. My wife and I just about went broke growing up, buying our kids musical instruments and buying them musical lessons so they could learn music. And we don't regret that at all. I want to encourage you, if you know music, some of you don't, I understand that, but, but if you got kids and, and they ever uh, verbalize the slightest interest in playing a musical instrument, you feed that. If you have to go broke doing it, you feed that. You'll never regret your children learning music. It'll add, a, 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 it'll add color to their life. Uh, if they know music, if they know music theory, there's just something about it. There's just something about it. Uh, that really, uh, you know, some of these people that know all this electronic stuff, you know, computers and internet and everything and so on and so forth, and then you got a dummy like me. You know what they all do? They all feel sorry for me. Cell phones and iPads and iPhones and smartphones and so on. I don't know any of that. They all feel sorry for me. You know why? Because there's an element of life they think I'm missing out on. But they're probably right. I don't know. But you know, that's how I feel about music. Those that know music, I feel sorry for those that don't because there's an element of life they're missing out on. It's never too late to learn about music and play an instrument. And uh, use it. And, and by the way, when people are playing, listen to them. Um, listen to them, okay? Offertories are not times to fellowship. They're times to praise the Lord with musical instruments, a very powerful medium. And as I've said before, a good piano player has put more time learning the piano and practicing piano than any brain surgeon has ever spent learning how to do brain surgery. You probably want to pay attention to him. He's going to work on your brain. And uh, music is a way that we ought to praise the Lord. For thou, Lord, verse 4, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. This is a great verse that some of you have experienced and can say amen to. Some of you maybe are having a struggle. Some of you think that if you surrender your life to the Lord, you'll never be happy again. You're going to be miserable. Some of you have been duped. Somewhere along the line, you've been duped. And you've been told that if you ever surrender your life to the Lord, and if you ever serve the Lord, that you'll never smile again, You'll never be happy again. You're going to miss out on everything in the world. But this verse says, For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. Do you want to know when I was miserable? Back when I was doing drugs. Back when I was drinking. Back when I was getting drunk. Back when I was partying and going to concerts. Let me tell you something. I was never so miserable in my life. Do you want to know... When I've been, the, been glad, about ready to say the gladdest. I don't know if that's the, a word or not. Sometimes I make up English words when I'm preaching. You know, when I've been the gladdest in the work of the Lord, 
I can't believe God would give me another chance to do anything and have so much joy doing it that I've never wanted to go back to the husks and the pig trough of life again that I was eaten out of at one time. Those of you who fear surrendering your life to the Lord, finding what God's will is for you, please stop. Memorize verse 4. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. Not only has he made me glad, but victorious. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. Boy, those are the people who get the victory. It's those who get involved in God's work. I will triumph in the work of thy hands. You're not going to be defeated. You're not going to be miserable. You're going to say, man, that's the greatest thing going. Why didn't I surrender myself to this earlier? The work. God has a work for you. God has a will for you. God has a way for you. Don't, don't miss God's will and God's work for this world. This world is not worth it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And you'll be glad and you'll triumph. Oh, Lord, verse 5, how great are thy works and thy thoughts are very deep. Isn't salvation a great work? That's something you couldn't pull off. Amen? Something I couldn't pull off. Try your hardest all your life. You can never save your soul, but the Lord can do it for you like about that fast. The instant you believe on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and receive him as your savior, and you become a new man in Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, and, and, and not only does he save your soul, but he begins to change you, and you're a new man, a new woman in Christ, and, 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 and notice the exclamation point. You end up saying, oh, Lord, how great are thy works. Exclamation point. I can't believe what you've done in my life, oh, God. That's, all, that, that's us. This is a great song to sing every week, wouldn't it be? To remind us of how good God is, how he ought to be praised, and how he ought to be thanked, and we ought to play instruments to him and, and be glad in his work and be victorious in his work. How great are they? And thy thoughts are very deep. God has a lot of deep thoughts, you know that? And the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And when we go to church, the Bible says, we hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And we learn deep things about God at church. We learn deep things about God at home when we open up our Bibles. We learn deep things when we're driving in our car and saying, Oh, Holy Spirit, speak to me. And, and we meditate upon what we had, we had read in our Bibles earlier that day. The Spirit's here. I mean, I mean, if you want a deep life, if you want a deep life, get to know God. Get to know God. Thy thoughts are very deep. Thy thoughts are very deep. Not only are they very deep, they're very high. Isaiah 55, verse 9, as the heavens are high above the earth, so far are thy thoughts towards me. I mean, I don't care how deep you want to go or how you want to go, God has something he can teach you. You know, God can teach you and I all the rest of our lives, and we can just get to the end of our lives and barely have scratched the surface. You know, when I was a teenager, I knew it all. I really did, man. I knew it all. And uh, you couldn't tell me anything. Now, I know a lot of our teens are not like that, but I was, man. I knew it all. You can't tell me anything. And as soon as the pastor started preaching and announced his subject, <laughs> I know this, man. I can zone out. Boy, the older I get now, the less I know. Even though I know more than I've ever known before, it's just, it's kind of like going through the Blue Ridge Parkway, through Tennessee Hills there and Georgia and stuff. Every time you go around a curve, it gets better. Then you go around another curve, and it gets better. And then you go around another curve, and then you stop stopping your car. You used to stop your car, I got to get a picture of this. And you go to the next row, I got to get a picture of this. I got to get a picture of this. And then you're saying, like, wait a minute, that was nothing back there. This is so much better. And you just keep going. And finally, you just say, man, I'm just going to enjoy the ride. And that's how is the path of the just groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. And brethren, I, boy, I hope nobody here has stopped learning. Please don't. There's so much God wants to teach us, the deep things of God. A brutish man, that's the natural man, verse 6, knoweth not. Neither doth a fool understand this. They, they have no clue what we're talking about. They think we're idiots. 
the brutish man understandeth not. It says here, he knoweth not. The brutish man is the natural man, it says in the New Testament, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned or understood. The brutish man, you know, let us not envy those that are not in Christ. Sometimes the believer uh, gets his uh, sight Skewed, and he starts to focus on the lost who seem to be having a better time, and, 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 but they don't know. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. They don't understand these things. We want to encourage you to walk with the Lord. Look at their end, verse 7. When the wicked spring is the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. They flourish. Okay, we're going to see the word flourish three times later in the chapter. About one o'clock when we get there. No, I'm just kidding. They flourish, but remember this for later. They flourish like grass. They flourish like grass. What do we do with grass? You cut it down. Back then they used to cut it down and burn it, right? So Jesus said, the grass, they cut down and give it to the fire. And that's what it says here about them. They flourish. Oh, yeah, the workers of iniquity flourish. But it's like grass. They're like grass. It is that, they, uh, verse uh, 7, when the wicked spring as the grass and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. It talks about everlasting destruction over in the book of Second. Uh, Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 7 through 9. They shall be destroyed with everlasting destruction. What an end. That's not God's will. God doesn't want anybody to be destroyed in an everlasting fire, in hell, in a lake of fire. God doesn't want that. God wants us to be saved. Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. Man, eternity is a long time, and you're going to spend somewhere in eternity, heaven or hell. And I'd like to encourage you this morning to care enough about your soul, your eternal soul, to trust Christ as your Savior. Trust Christ as your Savior. Uh, don't, uh, just, just take God at his word in the scriptures. Trust Christ as your Savior. He'll save you from all your sins. And he'll make you righteous in his sight. And he'll take you to heaven, not by anything you've done, but solely by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But thou, Lord, verse 8, art most high forevermore. They're like the grass. That's all. They're going to be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forever. Remember back in verse 1, we were talking about the most high? Here it comes again. It's not going to be Lucifer who's the most high forever. Amen? It's going to be God who's the most high forever. And every knee shall bow to him. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he'll be the uppermost God, the most high forever. And praise the Lord for all the other titles he has. Enjoy them. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Amen. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Learn the names of God. Every one of them ministers to you. But someday he'll be the most high. You can bank on it. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. And they're going to perish. Don't envy them. Don't run with them. Don't be a friend of this world. Be separate. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you, and you shall be sons and daughters unto me. But my horn, verse 10, shalt thou exalt like the horn of an unicorn. I will be anointed with fresh oil. Notice this word horn here in verse 10 refers to our power to serve. It's a physical illustration. It's actually literally the, a horn that, that comes off of a unicorn, which, which we believe was like a, a horse-like type of a, a creature. Nobody knows exactly what a unicorn is, but something maybe like a ram's horn. But the horn was used in, in Jewish uh, idioms as a reference to our power to serve, our power to serve. And it says at the end of verse 10, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. 
We know that oil is one of the seven emblems or seven pictures of the Holy Spirit of God that are listed for us in the Bible. Good study for you to do sometime. Oil, fresh oil. We can have it fresh. I know some of you maybe have had wonderful experiences in your past where you were filled with the Holy Spirit, where God used you to preach, to teach, to sing, to lead people to Christ, to get prayers answered. And that's wonderful experiences we've had in our past. But brethren, we need to be filled and anointed with fresh oil today. We need something fresh. And it might be good. It might be a good day, a good time, a good season in our lives to get back into our prayer closets, shut the door. And when the Lord who sees you pray in secret, he'll reward you openly. And to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray in Luke 11, verse 13, who said, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? And we need to ask for a greater measure and supply and a refilling of the Holy Spirit and get stirred up again. Because that oil was used so that the, the lamps could burn and burn bright. And too many of us are getting too dim. I think the, the light of Christianity is too dim in this country. And we need to get some people filled with the Holy Spirit again. I want to encourage your pursuit of the Holy Spirit. This was a song they sang every Saturday. God was trying to remind them every Saturday, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. I shall be anointed. Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies. And mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. Just mark this down. We win in the end. We win in the end. It's time, like, like I said before, there's times where it seems like Christians are getting their brains bashed in in this world, and, and they're being martyred, they're being persecuted. Even in America, the walls are closing in on us a little bit. I mean, we barely have any pressure in America compared to the persecution our brothers and sisters in the Lord have in other countries. All right? I mean, let's not hang our heads like it's so hard. We're too blessed to be stressed in this country, all right? We may have a little pressure once in a while. Somebody swears at us or something. But there's persecution going down in this world like almost we've never seen before. And it's just, it, it, it's like a snowball. It's just getting tracked. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and maybe someday they'll be coming for us. I don't know. I don't know. But whatever happens, remember, Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies, and mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. And so there's coming a day uh, when God will keep his promise. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Vengeance is mine. And uh, he's going to have the last word. God's going to have the last word. He's going to have the last laugh, too. Now, in closing, notice the word flourish in verse 12, 13, and 14 as I read through the end of the chapter. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Notice the song they sang every Saturday ends with a wonderful, wonderful promise. Flourish, verse 12. Flourish, verse 13. Flourishing, verse 14. Earlier in the chapter, we saw in verse 7 that the wicked shall flourish like grass. But in verse 12, we shall flourish like what? What's it say? Like the palm tree and the what? The cedar. All right, what do you do with grass? You mow it every week. What do you do with your trees? You never touch them. You leave them there. Man, they're anchored. They're permanent. You see the cedar tree, the cedar tree and the palm tree were the two most glorious trees in all of the Holy Land. And that is our heritage as the saints of God. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. I love palm trees. 
You can ask my wife. I take pictures of them wherever I go. I wish we had palm trees up here. I love palm trees. There's all kinds of different palm trees, you know that? Uh, yeah, go, go down south sometime and just see them. I remember being stationed at Fort Gordon, Georgia. And they had a military day at Disneyland in Florida. All the military could go all day for four bucks. And I said, man, I can't wait to get to Florida. I want to see palm trees. And as I'm driving out of the fort where I was stationed, Fort Gordon, I noticed at the gate palm trees everywhere. I just never saw them. Right there. I love palm trees. Cedar trees. You make houses out of cedar trees. Remember that? Solomon made his house out of cedar. The Lord's house, the floors and stuff, the cedar. You see, that's how we flourish. They flourish like grass. We flourish like palm trees, like cedar trees. Man, that's like, there's, there's a permanency about that. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a regality about that, a royalty about that. There's, there's something stately about that. Palm trees, cedar trees. Who, the righteous. Verse 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. You're going to flourish spiritually if you'll be planted in the house of God. I don't know if all of you go to church. we got guests here today, but wherever you're from, wherever you live, get planted in the house of the Lord. Those of you that come here, get planted in the house of the Lord. Now, planted means get your roots down. Don't just attend, but man, get involved. Get your roots down. For they that be planted in the courts, a house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Get planted. And you'll start being fruitful. Verse 14. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age and shall be fat and flourishing. You're not put on the shelf in old age by God. God doesn't say, ah, we're going to send you out to pasture. You run your laps. No. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Man, stay in church, folks. Get planted in, in, in the house of the Lord. That's a special place with special promises. Don't leave. Don't quit. If you get offended, just get over it. Get through it somehow. You get your feelings hurt. Or somebody ignores you or somebody does something wrong. Yeah, we're humans. We're sinners. We're, we're a hospital for the sick. Stay. Get rooted. Don't go off to college and get your head all twisted up with all kinds of philosophies and evolutions, get rooted. This will be good. You'll, you'll, you'll bear fruit in your youth and in your old age. See, the church is a platform that God has created from, which, from that platform from which you can serve the Lord. You can teach a Sunday school class, a junior church. You can sing. You can drive a bus. You can take teens to the youth rally. And Wasn't that great? Man, Friday night we had a blast. What a sermon. Wow, that was good. I'm still thinking about that one. That was fantastic. Man, we had a good night. You could go lead people to Christ and go to nursing homes and prisons and all. You can do all that from the platform of the local church. You go on missions trips. So much you can do. And be fruitful doing it. Brethren, we got, a, we got an orange tree in our house over here in Angola. It's got oranges all over it. I'm serious. You come to our house, I'll show you our orange trees. Got oranges all over it. They're orange. You can eat them. I've been eating a couple of them lately. You know why? Because that thing got planted in our house about eight years ago. And that thing has adapted to its environment. And that thing has learned how to be fruitful. I mean, we have kept that thing watered and kept it in sunlight inside the house. You put it outside one day and it's going to die. Just one day it's going to be dead. But, boy, you keep that in the right environment, it's just going to bear fruit. Over 30 oranges on that thing this year. And uh, they're not big, but, but uh, we've enjoyed watching that. It's starting to bear fruit. At first, it didn't bear anything. And one year, it had one on it. Another year, it had about four. That, that's, we, we grow. It's a, it's, a, it's a visual aid for me to see about growth. But then, then it just gets to where 
Man, my dad had an apple tree we planted one time. Nothing for eight years, nothing. And we got an apple. And I'm talking about a low profile apple tree about this high at the most. We kept it trimmed. Do you know one year he got 11 and a half bushels of apples off of that tree? Fat and flourishing. And the branches with the most fruit bow the lowest. You just think about that for a while. God wants you to be fruitful. What a song. I know it's scattered, but what a song. He is my rock, verse 15. You see that? He is my rock. Not Peter, but God is my rock. And so we ought to give thanks to the Lord. We ought to praise the Lord. We ought to play musical instruments. We ought to get involved in his work. Verse 4, you'll be glad. You won't be miserable. You'll triumph. You'll see how great the Lord's works are in verse number 5. In verses 5 through 9, don't worry about your enemies. Don't worry about the lost. They're just like grass. Yeah, they're growing like weeds, but man, they get mowed down in a hurry. And then they're no more. But we're like palm trees, cedar trees. And we're fixed. We're fruitful. And even to old age, you just stay in church. Even if the church is no good, you stay in, and you'll be able to bear some fruit all the way till you're old. Wouldn't that be great? Meet God with a bunch of fruit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this psalm. And we ask your blessing now on these thoughts as they, they are scattered. They they, they change as we go through the psalm, but we pray that your Holy Spirit now would make some kind of an application uh, in a personal way to everybody that's here, and maybe somebody is not saved, needs to come to know the Lord right now. Please, Lord, we pray they wouldn't leave without Christ. And those of us that are believers, that we get our eyes off the world and the people of the world and realize how blessed we are. We're not going to be miserable. We're going to be glad. And we're going to triumph in the works of thy hands. God help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take our songbook and turn.